I guess I wanted to, to, to start with why, why has this one team held such a grip, not just over Chicago, it's kind of obvious that it would, it's the last time the Bears have won, but really over, over an entire sports culture. Why do we still keep going back? I mean, there's a national commercial right now that has Dicka and McMahon in it for Overstock.com. Like, it's been a long time. Right. Why do we still care? I spent, like, you know, whole bucks figuring that out. I mean, you're from Boston, so you don't know, man, but the 85 Bears came I remember after, that game. Well, they yes, came after the 84 Cubs. Right, 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 right. Right, so yeah. the 84 Cubs were winning two, to noth two games to Is nothing going to the World Series. Padres, Steve Garvey shoved his stupid fist in all of our faces. And, yeah. and, and, um, the 80 f and all my whole life, I was born in 1968. The last team to win was the 63 Bears. The Chicago Sting won the indoor soccer championship, <laughs> and they tried to make it like a big deal. <laughs> and that's how hungry we were. My kids have Sting posters on the wall. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they still around? No, I don't. And the, uh, that'd be amazing. Yeah. But, you know, and then the 84 Bears, the, the Bears, they slowly built, and they, they were, first of all, they were, to me, they're the first team that sort of became a huge pop culture. That's the one where football blows past baseball. They had all these sort of, it's almost like as if you're watching The Godfather and, no, and Sonny Corleone puts on a football plaid and plays tackle football, you know? <laughs> because you had, hovering in the background, George Hallis, the old man who started the NFL, and on his deathbed basically hired Ditka, who'd been basically sent into exile when he said that uh, Hallis was so cheap he throws around nickels like they're manhole covers. And then Ditka went to Philadelphia, went to Dallas. He came back. He was completely insane. He had a perm. He wore little shorts. He had these press conferences where reporters would ask questions, and he would just stare at him and say, next. And uh, he threw gum in a lady's hair in San Francisco, and she, like, it was everything was... And then you had Jim McMahon, the quarterback from Brigham Young, who got expelled from the school for violating the Mormon code. After, he, he, had, after he had played out his After his he played his last game, and he showed up in Lake Forest with a six-pack of beer, asking for more beer because he was a little dry, <laughs> you know? And you had all these elements going on at the same time. And, and the amazing thing is you could go to Soldier Field and watch. You'd watch Ditka call a screen pass, You'd see McMahon change the play. You'd see Ditka kick a cooler. You'd see McMahon throw a touchdown and the Bears win a game. You know, and, and they had this also really, like seriously, they changed football because they had this revolutionary defense, which was the 46 defense. Named after the guy who wasn't on the team that year. Right, but my favorite player when I was a kid, Doug Plank. Who who's, who's figures prominently in the book. He is like sort of the hero in the book in a certain way. He's called the human missile. When I called him, he explained football in a way I'd never heard. He said, I said, what makes a great hitter? Because he wasn't a big guy and he wasn't a fast guy. And he said, run into a wall. A normal person will slow down just before they hit the wall. Yeah. A hitter will actually accelerate. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, as long as you can sort of suppress your survival instincts, you can do incredible damage on the football field. And this was a guy who used to carry smelling salts in his waistband to revive himself, because <laughs> he would knock himself unconscious. And he said that he would get up after a play, look down to see if he was wearing the blue jersey or the white jersey, then say, oh, I'm wearing a white jersey. I should go stand next to the guys in the white jerseys and pretend like I know what's happening. And he, had a great, he said that they'd give him the, now everything we know, the concussion test. They'd say, how many fingers? He said the trick was everyone knew it was always two fingers. <laughs> So it's like a super colorful team that kind of reached this point in 85 where they just not only beat teams, I mean, they destroyed teams. It was like the young Mike Tyson. They would get on the field and other teams like your Patriots. Yeah. What, was the, what was the game plan against the Patriots? No, I'm just... <laughs> the, the game plan was always, as Doug Plank said, football's tackle, chess, why chase pawns all over when you could just knock out the king. Yeah. So the, the, the funny thing about... The, the book, or I don't know if it's the funny thing, is, and you, you address it. You read the book, and you get super, I got super into the fact that these guys were destroying <laughs> the other teams, and physically destroying the other teams, and often themselves as well. And then yet, in the background the whole time, and you don't shy away from it, is the modern day football era. So, so are you at peace with loving the Bears, loving the 85 Bears? but also knowing that that style of football, because of the concussion issue, because of other issues as well, just is gone. 
Yeah, I mean, they played in a different era because of what we know about the concussion issues. It's almost like bare-knuckle fighting era or something like that. It's like, you know, their game plan was basically knock out the quarterback. And Doug, Doug, Buddy Ryan, who was a defensive coordinator, used to, at a certain point every game, say, it's time to open a new can of quarterback. <laughs> you know? So you had to, like, basically take them for what they were for when they were. But they were such great athletes. They had, you know, four future Hall of Famers on that team. And they really should have more. But the Bears are actually running out of jerseys. You know, they're, they're um, retiring Ditka's jersey only now, this December, because basically they don't want it because they don't have to go into the triple digits. Yeah, you know, yeah. so they have they they had this great team. They would have been great in any era, but their style actually created the modern game. Because how do you stop it? And the way you stop it is the way games look now. So you have to. Well, let's talk about what was the forty six. The forty six was with name for Doug Plank, and basically, not to get too jargony about it, it was every kid's fantasy. If you ever played tackle football with your friends, which is. Why not just have everybody rush at the quarterback? Why not have everybody kill the quarterback? Yeah. You know, and Buddy Ryan, and it, the 46, what they would technically do is they would move a linebacker up to the line. They would take Doug Plank, number 46, the safety, and move him into the linebacker position. And they might have another guy like Gary Fensick come in at the line. And they would create these situations where there were free runners, unblocked guys that would come flying out of nowhere and knock down the quarterback. As Doug Plank said, when a free runner hits the quarterback, the quarterback flies. And so that was the 46. And when you'd watch it, when I was a kid, I'd watch it with my father, and there would be a moment when they'd go into it, and Mike Singletary was a middle linebacker, and he was like a captain of the defense, and he would call an audible, which defenses really hadn't done, and you'd see all these guys start moving, and my dad would say, they're coming. And you could look at the eyes of the quarterbacks and their team, and they'd look up, and they're like, uh-oh, I'm dead. You know, and I interviewed Danny White. Yeah. Danny White was a quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys in the greatest game in the franchise history of the Bears, when after years of taking crap with the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders and Golden Richards and Tom Landry, the Bears went to Dallas and beat them 44 to nothing. And Danny White told me that was the only time in his entire career when his only thought was, get rid of the ball as quickly as I can. <laughs> if I have to hand it off, throw it away, as long as I'm holding this ball, I'm a dead man. So, I mean, the thing in football is that the defense or the offense innovates, and then the other side eventually catches up, it always happens. Why did it take so long for other teams to see this is what they're doing? Well, actually, one coach did see it, and that was Don Shula. They lost the And the, the one Dolphins. game they lost was to the Rams, and Shula realized. Dolphins. I mean, to the Dolphins, sorry. And Shula realized, basically, the 46 was so strong that the best strategy for him was to use its own strength against it. And he let the Bears come in and rush in, and then they had Dan Marino, one of the greatest quarterbacks in history, roll out of the pocket. It gave him a couple of extra seconds, and then he could find all the weaknesses in the 46 of guys downfield wide open. And a lot of the 46 was the whole mystique of the 46. You know, Dan Hampton said he knew the Super Bowl was over the Wednesday before the game <laughs> when he saw Tony Eason, the Patriots quarterback, at a press yeah. conference and looked at his eyes and saw nothing but a screaming man somewhere <laughs> deep in his eyes. So, you know, it, it, took, it took a while, but it actually really probably took that season Dan Marino who had the quickest release, they say, in the history of football. The quarterback got rid of the ball so fast, combined with you know Don Shula, maybe the greatest coach to ever coach. So there's a great moment in that Dolphins game that you talk about in the book, which, which leads to the, the rift that existed between Dicka and Buddy Ryan, the defensive coordinator. And that's that the defense was not working at, at that point in that game. And, and what, is, what does Ditka say to, to Buddy Ryan on the, on the sidelines? Well, Ditka, the way the, the Ditka wanted Buddy Ryan to switch out of the 46 defense into a nickel defense where they basically had five defensive backs covering the receivers. He's like, put in the fucking nickel. Put in the fucking nickel. And Buddy said, F you know, fuck off, Ditka. Put in the nickel. Fuck off, Ditka. That's why it was so great to watch as a fan because it was happening. So, so the, the situation there is that Buddy Ryan had carte blanche to do what he wanted. Right, and that's because Buddy Ryan came in with the previous coach and he had this breakthrough on the defense and the defensive captains of the Bears at the time, Gary Fensick and Alan Page, wrote a letter to George Hallis and said, let us keep our coach. And Hallis said, okay, so that you had Buddy Ryan who reported to ownership and Mike Ditka who was the head coach but couldn't fire the defensive coach. So you in essence had two defensive coaches who really hated each other, you know? So the result was the practices became like games, more violent than games. 
So by the time they faced the Patriots, it was nothing compared to what they'd faced all practice. Ditka said that the toughest team he ever played against was the 85 Bears in practice. <laughs> <laughs> so, so help me out with this. There's obviously a huge mystique around Ditka. To this day, I think some people laugh at him, but overall Chicago loves Ditka. And yet he didn't control the defense, which is what the team is known for. And then on the offensive side, there were, there were countless instances in the book in which McMahon goes off and does his own thing. And he was the only quarterback that you write who was ever able to really do his own thing because he would just look Dick in the eye and say, fuck you, and do what he wanted, even though no matter how upset Dick had got. So what was Dick's, why was Dick so special to the team? Why was he so essential? If he didn't control the quarterback half the time and he couldn't control the defense. Well, my whole childhood, and if you talk to the Bears that era, the Bears had a lot of players that just kind of dogged it. They were a team in a funk. And the funk had really lasted since the late 60s. And again, to quote Doug Plank, because he was so good, he said, there's three kinds of coaches. There's an aspirin coach. If you have some problems, he comes in and fixes it. There's the penicillin coach. If you have like serious problems, he can cure you. But if you got cancer, the penicillin coach does no good. For that, you need the chemotherapy coach. And Mike Ditka was the chemotherapy coach. He came in and he completely said, We're, this is a different team. This is a different organization. We're going to the Super Bowl. We're winning the Super Bowl. And most of you are not going to be here when we do it. And he worked their asses off. And he changed the attitude. And he got rid of the guys that were dogging it, even some of whom were great players. And he was really, for that team at that time in this city, he was a great coach. You know, people now sort of look at him. What you see now is Mike Ditka uh, is sort of playing a version of what he was when he was 40, 44, 45 years old. He was a great football player, and he was a great coach in that team. He made no sense in New Orleans. That would be like planting a palm tree in Minnesota. Just didn't make any sense. It didn't. But for the Bears, he was the best coach. And the tension with Buddy was kind of creative dysfunction. It, it made them better. So you interviewed a whole host of players and, of course, Ditka. One of the, the things you learn kind of early in journalism is don't interview your heroes or don't try to be friends with them, the people that you interview. Was there, did you come out of writing the book in a, in a better place than when you started or did you find out things about these guys that you didn't want to know or did, it, did they leave you disappointed? Well, I'm glad I didn't go to journalism school, I have to say. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I like if, Interviewing these guys is one of the great pleasures of my life, and why else would I be doing anything if I wasn't doing that? I mean, I love them as I, when I was 17 years old, I got two tickets to the Super Bowl, and I couldn't get on a plane because all the seats were booked, and there were all the trains were booked, and I wound up, somebody said, there's some guys who have a Bears charter, and you can go with them. There's a couple seats, and me and I, I was senior in high school, and I thought it was going to be a bunch of businessmen. It was a bunch of sort of super fans, as we'd know from Center Night Live, who had chartered a plane. And they were, we got there, and some of them had been drinking for six or seven hours. This and it was a plane full of drunken fans. This ends up being the saddest story you'll ever hear. And they were, got up while we were taking off. They were throwing footballs around. They were drinking. They wouldn't sit down. And a lot of them were arrested when we landed. And I felt like and, it was and my responsibility. And couldn't go to the game. No. Yeah. It was my responsibility as a Bears fan <laughs> to carry them in my heart. <laughs> And to enjoy that game, and not just for me, but for them. And that this book is me paying a very old debt to those super fans. Did they get a free copy? If I could find, if they contact me, if you were on that flight, <laughs> L1011 out of O'Hare to New Orleans. Um, you know, when you ask, when you ask people in your family growing up, if you talk to, if I talk to my mom and she remembers her dad in one way and my uncle will remember the same guy in a different way or things that happened in many different ways, you know, Rashomon or whatever. What are, what, when you talk to the member of the Bears, did, did McMahon say, this is what happened? And then you talk to Singletary and he said, no, 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 this is what happened. Then you talk to Fencing and go, no, no. Did they, did they agree on things? Well, you know, it's interesting. Like you said, some people like Ditka, some people don't. And it's some of the, true with the players too. Some of the players love Ditka as like so the most important figure in their lives and some hated him and some are still trying to figure out what Ditka did and what it meant. And they're searching for hidden meanings, you know? Which is, if I interviewed Jim Morrissey, who's a linebacker, who's a rookie on the team, a great guy. And he told me a story about when he was, he had to have his knee scoped. And he went to Ditka and said, should I have it done now in preseason? 
or should I wait till the end of the season? And Ditka said, do it now. You'll be more healthy. You might miss a couple games, but it's better to do it now. So he did it, and he was traveling with the team in street clothes. And they went, and they played a preseason game, and they, got, they lost. And normally, he said, you go on the team plane, and Ditka and some guys sat in first class, and all the players sat in coach. And he thought, you know, normally I wouldn't want to see Ditka after a loss, but I didn't play, and I'll go up to first class seats. And Ditka sees him and goes, nice fucking game, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> And he said to me, you know, I'm still trying to figure out what, what was Ditka trying to teach, you know? What was his lesson? Do you get a sense that the team, uh, do, they, do they keep in touch? Do they, are they friends? I mean, they always will share this, this moment, this moment in time. Well, that's like the most poignant thing. And I, for me, it was, I'm making, being kind of funny about it, but it was actually an emotional book for me. And, um, because to me... You watch these guys, it's a human story, and they go through everything every person alive goes through uh, on an amplified level. And I always think football players basically die twice because their whole life is built towards this moment, and then it ends, and it ends publicly, and they go through a kind of a death. You know, and um, really looking at that group of guys as they existed in 80, 81, it's just reminded me of me and my friends in high school, me and my friends in college, and you want to be with those guys in that moment forever, but you just can't be. I mean, life just takes you away from that. And the guys who try to stay in it, it's really, it's horrible. And um, I talked to them, and every one of them, McMahon, Plank, Fensick, every one of them, what they missed was being with the group of guys. And um, they don't talk to each other. And it's like a train, you're, it's like the Tom Wolf thing, you're on the bus or you're off the bus. And I asked every one of them, tell me about the last play in your career. And every one of them, it was so vivid, that memory. Um, and Plank told me a story, I keep coming back to Plank, but he was so good to talk to, about when he got cut by Ditka. And he was leaving. You know, they put their stuff like in a garbage bag. Uh, Fensick said it takes 15 minutes to, un to unload your locker. Puts his stuff in a garbage bag. He's leaving the Bears training facility. He runs into Jeff Fisher, who's now the head coach sure. of the Rams. And Jeff Fisher said, what's going on? He said, I was cut. And he said, Fisher's eyes just glazed over. It was like, all right, man, we're done. Yeah. You know, we have this past together, but you're off the team now. Wow. And that's just like, and you see the way different people respond to it. Some very well, some not so well. They, they struggle in different ways. So that was, you know, very, very intense. And um, just asking every one of those guys is fascinating. What about the fact that, and I guess this would be true of any group of people who drift away and and reach an older age, but particularly with football, there are some people who are doing really, really well. Physically, they're doing pretty well, and they're doing well because of investments or jobs. And then there's others who are just not doing well at all, or some of right. course have passed away. Did you, did you get any sense from the players of how they felt about, is there any sense of resentment toward each other? I didn't get any sense of resentment. You know, I mean, it's, it's, what you say is absolutely true. And I sort of felt that was an interesting thing about the book, an idea I had, which is if you track these guys who were together at this time, at the peak moment of their lives, they went off to live every version of the American experience. So Gary Fensick, like a private equity guy, been very successful in business. Mike Richardson, who was a cornerback on the team, wound up you know, in prison. A bunch of them are head coaches in the NFL. I mean, they've every different kind of life they've lived. But I think when you, when you talk to them about each other, it's just incredibly fond. Those guys loved each other. You know, and McMahon said to me, when he's walking me out of his house, he said, say, say when you see the boys, tell them Max says hello. You know, you got this sense. Of, and, and, you know, I was lucky because I went to the White House when they visited the White House a couple years ago, and you got to see them all together. But that was one of the few times when they actually see each other. Talk about your visit with McMahon, because that's, for me, it was one of my favorite chapters in the book. First of all, McMahon was wearing a T-shirt that said, got milk. And then underneath it said, no got pot. <laughs> so that was very funny. I mean, I was sort of, I was sort of nervous. I was sort of nervous to talk to McMahon because I'd read about how, you know, he was part of the concussion case and he was, has early stages of dementia. And he, but when I saw him, he was fantastic. It was, he was, I, when I went to the Super Bowl, when I was 17, I went to. I ended up going to Tulane because I went down there and never left. Because I came from here in January, went down there. I'm like, I'm staying down there. Yeah, yeah. And um, you I went came back from the Super Bowl. Yeah, I came back yeah, from the okay. Super Bowl. But yeah, I, then, yeah. then I applied to Tulane yeah. and went there because wasn't of that. you didn't just walk over and say I want to just be. That here. would have been preferable. Yeah. 
And um, when I, I went to Pat O'Brien's when I was a 17 years old drinking Hurricanes, and a bunch of those guys were just hanging out back there, including <laughs> McMahon. Right before the like game. Right before the game. And I always say, one of us is wearing a McMahon jersey, and it wasn't him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he was incredibly cool to me and when I was a kid. Yeah. And the next time I meet him, it's like two years ago in Scottsdale, Arizona. He's a kind of a wreck. And um, talking to him was great, but I had this, I, my father's favorite book when I was a kid was A Boys of Summer, which was about the 55 Brooklyn Dodgers. Roger Kahn. Roger Kahn. And I sort of always from the beginning thought this could, book could be like The Boys of Summer in a way about that Bears team because they were bigger than a team. They, to me, they represented a whole era in the city. And Roger Kahn at the end of those interviews would always have a baseball and a couple gloves in his car and he'd ask the old guys to play and they'd play catch, you know. And, the sun would go down. It was like the natural, and the Randy <laughs> Newman song would come up, and <laughs> Golden Retriever would run through the fields, and I thought I would do that. <laughs> I was ex so I brought a football, and I asked McMahon if he wanted to play catch, and he's like, play catch, man. I can't even throw my keys. You know, so it was like, it's not baseball. It was a rough, violent, and McMahon played, I think McMahon only played 100 games in the course of a 14-year wow. career. Tell the story of McMahon with, with his... Son, his son was on a hockey team, right? And there was a fellow dad. Tell that story. Well, this was like wild to me because I grew up in Glencoe. I played hockey as a kid, and my son now plays hockey. So, hockey parents are something I've been used to dealing with my entire life. And he told a story about being at one of the rinks on the North Shore, and there was a parent. He said, f "I mean, he's, this is what he's telling me: flipping off kids on the ice." And he, all of a sudden, McMahon goes up to the guy and goes, hey, what you doing, wise guy? Flipping off little kids? Why don't you, you know, and all of a sudden, you're at a hockey game and Jim McMahon's about to punch you in the <laughs> face. And then Jim McMahon has his son come out and basically punch the guy. And McMahon's so, son does. Yeah. He tells, Mc, he tells his son, punch the guy. He says, do you want to hit the guy? Yeah. And his son says, yes. And he says, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and his son does. And then the guy takes a step towards his son, and McMahon goes, one more step, pal. And the guy doesn't do anything, McMahon goes, that's what I thought. <laughs> and then I always think in the way of uh, William Holden in The Wild Bunch says, let's go. <laughs> and they walk out of the Northbrook I Ice Arena. <laughs> <laughs> All right, real, real quick, I could talk forever about this, but real quick, connect, connect the, and this is how the book kind of starts, Connect the Bears, the 85 Bears, with the history of football. Why, why were the 85 Bears such a direct, natural kind of result of where football had come from? To me, the Bears were a culmination. First of all, what we have now is a very violent game. But the violence of the game really goes back to the origins of the game, which is pro football comes out of little factory towns and coal towns around the, the Midwest, really, and Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois. And there was violent life, and these guys played a violent game for fun. And, um, and George Hallis was a great football player at Crane Tech and at University of Illinois. He won the MVP in the Rose Bowl. Uh, and he came back, and he's working as a civil engineer, and Staley, A.E. Staley of Staley Starch, asked if he'd move down to Decatur, Illinois, and start a factory football team, and that's the Decatur Staley's. So if you look in the Bears record book, they played their first NFL season as the Staley's. Then Hallis started the NFL because basically Hallis was a guy that always wanted to be in first place. And if you don't have rankings and don't have a league, how can you tell who's in first place? So he started a league with, uh, with the Canton Bulldogs, which were captained by Jim Thorpe and a bunch of other guys, and they started the NFL. And the NFL at the beginning was like three yards and a handful of dust. It was a very rough, violent plotting game. And they changed the rules to make the game more friendly to the pass. In the past, if you threw a pass and it was incomplete, you lost possession of the ball. Also, you could not throw a pass into the end zone. It was just impossible to pass. They changed the shape of the ball. And Hallis, with his assistant coaches, recognized these huge opportunities with the pass, and they introduced this thing called the, the modern T formation, which was the quarterback as we know it. The quarterback would now be a coach in the field, would take the ball and drop back behind the line, which is counterintuitive in a game that's about going forward, and cycle through all these options. And they realized a quarterback would have to be incredibly smart because he'd have to remember like 500 plays and still remember them after he'd been hit in the head about 10 <laughs> times. So they went to Columbia and they got Sid Luckman. <laughs> and they, they had the modern T formation 
And in 1940, I think they won the NFL title game against the Redskins 73 to nothing. Wow. And that was really the beginning of the modern offensive era of football. But what he had inadvertently done was make the quarterback so important, raise him to such a level of importance that a bunch of years later, along came Buddy Ryan and he said, why am I chasing 10 guys all over the field when I can just kill one? <laughs> and that became the 46 defense, which is, let's just knock out the quarterback. I mean, there is obvious irony in the fact that the Bears were the ones that first put the quarterback in such a pedestal, in such an important role, and yet that has so often been their weakness. Right. Well, not only that, yeah. I mean, you would, when, when I was a kid, the whole Bears defense was, the whole Bears offense was Walter right, Walter left, Walter up the middle. The Bears were very very boring team. I spoke to um, Bob Avellini, quarterback of my childhood, and he said that Ditka, he said if the, the fans only knew the truth about their hero, Iron Mike, he called plays like a drunken fan. <laughs> like they did know the truth, and a lot of them were drunk, man, and that's why they loved them. <laughs> and the fact is, if I was a coach of a football team, I would probably run eight or ten flea flickers a game. Every <laughs> play would be a trick play. So are you still, you know, you're, you're, you're older now than you were when you were 1985, obviously, you've, you've got a family. Are the Bears still, do they still, is this year's season still mean as much as it did then? That's a sad, I mean, I care about the Bears, I follow the Bears, but nothing means as much as it did when I was 17, you know? And I sort of think you have a team like that and you go up and down like that and you, it's like you can have relationships, but you can never really be in love ever again. Yeah. You know, there's a Frank Sinatra song, Love is Better the Second Time Around. Not the truth of football. <laughs> <laughs> Rich Cohen, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.